Um, this is work that we uh, finished uh, last year, John Bardier and I, um, and it's part of a Bank of England research program. Uh, however, the usual disclaimer applies. This is not in any way representing an official policy or intention of the Bank of England to do anything one way or the other. Uh, it is research. Uh, I, I am based in the research hub. Um, but in terms of the tax taxonomy that we have just heard, uh, Christoph's uh, taxonomy of different types of central bank money, it is about the fourth one, the last one, which he called perhaps the most interesting, and I would agree with that. So here is the dis disclaimer. Um, so uh, the emergence of DLT, the distributed ledger technology, uh, and of Bitcoin, which is one uh, incarnation thereof, was a watershed moment in the history of e-monies. Uh, it's a very, kind of, uh, a very special kind of e-money because, of course, apart from cash, all the monies that we hold today are e-monies, but this is based on the distributed ledger technology, uh, which is decentralized rather than centralized. Um, and one consequence of this technology is that it may now be technically feasible for central banks to offer universal access to their balance sheet. Um, and I'm only talking about technology for the time being. The rest of the paper, uh, the, the, paper the presentation, will be all about the economics. Uh, what central banks are operating today uh, electronically is RTGS system, real-time gross settlement systems, um, where in the UK, uh, less than 100 institutions have access to the RT RTGS system, and it's to clear settlement balances in an otherwise highly uh, centralized system and uh, it is technically uh, not feasible, held not to be feasible at this moment, uh, to give millions in the UK context, somewhere between 50 and 100 million accounts access uh, to the central bank balance sheet uh, using the RTGS technology. But it is felt, maybe, and the research is ongoing on that question, that DLT systems may be able to do that. The question that I want to ask, because I'm not a computer scientist, although John Bardier, my co-author, is both an economist and a computer scientist, and he brought uh, some very valuable information uh, to this project. Um, the, the question that I want to ask, is this economically desirable? It doesn't matter whether we can do it technically uh, if it's not economically desirable. So let's talk about that. So I want to now say first, what is a digital currency and then what is a central bank digital currency? Because the terms appear to be very often confused by uh, the audiences. Um, a, a tra in traditional electronic payment system, we have, a tier, we have a system of tiered ledgers, a pyramid of ledgers, uh, where payments are routed through uh, identifiable, specific third parties of which there are not that many, the large banks. Um, and uh, the, these parties are arranged in a hierarchical network where you and I, the customer, is at the bottom. Some institutions are in the next layer, and then there's other institutions that clear those institutions' payments, or those ins that there's, a, that there's the large institutions, and then there's the central bank. Right? Um, these third parties in the middle between you and I and the central bank hold deposits on behalf of end users, and these third parties, the large banks, let's say some, something like Barclays Bank uh, in, in the UK, they are critical to the operation of the system. Digital currencies operate with distributed ledgers where payments are peer-to-peer, -peer, and they're verified by multiple verifiers. Could be any of them. There's a network of verifiers, and whoever verifies it is actually a question of how the system is designed itself. There's many candidates. Um, they are arranged in a peer-to-peer -peer network, and the transactions verifiers are very different from banks in that they do not hold deposits on behalf of end users, and that any single one of them is not critical to the operation of the system. So if one of them decides to go, uh, to go on vacation in Tenerife uh, this week, that doesn't mean the system is not working. Right? Um, the uh, Bitcoin um, technology, the Bitcoin currency, combines a distributed ledger, DLT, with an alternative monetary system. And the, the approach that we have taken at the Bank of England in our research, in our research, 
uh, is to say that the monetary system of Bitcoin is something that we entirely reject. Uh, but the payment system is something that we can take inspiration from and it is much more widely applicable uh, than Bitcoin. So when you maintain the ledger in a system like that, you need to arrive at a consensus about what's on the ledger and what changes have been made to the ledger. And uh, uh, entry is open uh, when you have a system like Bitcoin. And so uh, suggested additions to the ledger are cheap talk. That's, a, that's actually an economics term. Um, and that means they are costless, non-binding, and non-verifiable, meaning anybody could say that I have received a million bitcoins yesterday. Um, in order for me to be able to actually use the million bitcoins, other people need to believe that I have them, right? And that the transfer has been made. And cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin make, uh, solve this problem by making the changes costly through a proof of work system where you have to solve a computationally very intensive problem. So you have to, you have to basically have some skin in the game in, in, in that sense. Uh, and prove that you have done some work in order to verify um, this payment. Now, that means that the probability of me winning this, me as a verifier, they're, they're called miners, uh, increases in my computing power, but it decreases in everybody else's computing power, which means that everybody piles into it and adds to computing power. The result is a negative externality whereby uh, there's a lot of overinvestment in computing power from a social point of view, not from a private point of view. Um, and as a result, there's a paper by O'Dwyer and Malone that we cite in our paper, and, and that's from back in 2014. That's already three years old. Um, and they uh, showed that Bitcoin in 2014 consumed about as much electricity as the country of Ireland. Let that sink in in order to process the payments volume of a medium-sized English town. This does not scale to something that you can nationally use as a payments medium. It cannot compete uh, at, at, at the level where it becomes of a sufficient scale to handle a national payment system. A permission system, which is what central bank digital currency, CBDC, would be all about, is to make proposed changes binding. So there you regulate the verifiers. The central bank regulates a network of verifiers. Um, and uh, therefore, trust in the central, part, the central bank and the delegated verifiers replaces the proof of work system so that you no longer need to use those enormous amounts of electricity. Uh, which is socially quite I extremely wasteful. And then what that means in terms of the terminology is we're no longer talking about a cryptocurrency here. It's a digital currency, but there's nothing crypto about it anymore. Okay? And so that's, that's important to keep in mind. So a central bank digital currency is access to the central bank's balance sheet without the central bank having to necessarily operate some sort of retail system. It's sort of like with cash. The central bank can basically electronically print that money uh, in the appropriate quantity, of course, macroeconomically speaking. And then uh, you and I and everybody else can use that among ourselves uh, to make payments. And the central bank doesn't have to have uh, retail services associated with this. Although private parties may want to offer such retail services, uh, and that, may, that is probably going to be, will be very useful. Uh, this will be available on a 24-7 basis, like cash. It would be universal for the purpose of uh, this particular research, i.e. banks, firms, and households would be able to access it. Um, electronic, probably using DLT. It would be, and this is critical, now we get to the macroeconomics, it would be national currency denominated with a one-to-one -one exchange rate between this currency and other forms of national money like reserves and like cash, what Christoph was talking about earlier. I will talk in a minute about how that's possible, this one-to-one -one exchange rate. It would be issued against, uh, through either spending or uh, against eligible assets. Central banks issue reserves and cash today against eligible assets, so no change there. And typically those eligible assets are government securities, and we're assuming the same thing in this paper. It would be interest-bearing, uh, so, and this is, this is really the critical point. This needs to be, in my view, or in our view, John and I, an interest-bearing money. 
Because if you have a currency that you issue on the part of the central bank, uh, and you don't quite know what demand is, and you, you push some supply out there, and let's say it's too much. It's more than what people want today at current prices. And then the interest rate that you pay on this is rigid, zero. You can't do anything to the interest rate. And then some other price is going to have to adjust to equate demand and supply. And what is that other price? It's the general price level. That's all that's left if you pay a zero interest rate or a fixed interest rate. And that means you get problems with price stability, which, of course, for a central bank is anathema, right? That's not what you want. But if you pay an interest rate on this currency, it is that interest rate which can equate demand and supply without having necessarily any consequences for first order consequences for the price level. Okay? And that, second, that interest rate is actually then a second interest rate that you can use as a tool of monetary policy, and I'll get to that towards the end. Um, this would be a currency that's coexisting with the existing banking system, where banks remain the creators of the marginal unit of domestic currency. Uh, the ma vast majority of deposits would remain with banks, and the credit provision would remain with banks. So this is not a system like what I outlined in some of my earlier other work, where banks would be completely doing something different from what they do today, uh, where banks literally would be only intermediating money rather than creating money. This is a system where banks still do exactly what they do today. Uh, but alongside banks would be a system of central bank digital currency with macroeconomic design features in place to make sure that this contributes rather than detracts from macroeconomic stability. So we, uh, and here I will be brief, I'm, I'm going to present some details of a model. This is ultimately very technical work, but for today's talk, I keep it at the very general level, and when I present formulas, I will also talk through them verbally. Uh, this is not supposed to be a, a, a mainly academic exercise. The, but we, are, we, ha we did build a cutting-edge, academically cutting-edge model uh, to simulate what would happen when you introduce digital currency into the U.S. economy. That's always, it's easiest to calibrate the U.S. economy. Uh, we know a lot about the data there, so that's what we did. It can, it, this can be applied to other economies, and we have some research projects going on in that domain. Uh, so it's based on my work with Jaromir Benesch and Zoltan Jakob, one of the most the Chicago plan revisited, and the other one, banks are not intermediaries. The households, very briefly, the households obtain deposits through bank loans. I'll talk about that in a second. Central bank digital currency, CBDC, uh, is uh, exchanged uh, against government debt when people want it. Uh, and CB, uh, D, CBDC and deposits, bank deposits, jointly generate the liquidity that you and I use to make purchases, i.e., we use uh, either our bank accounts or central bank digital currency in order to buy stuff. And so do companies, and so do banks, right? Um, banks in this model create um, deposits by making loans. Again, I'll talk about that in a minute. And the government pursues fiscal policy, traditional monetary policy that all the central bankers around here know everything about, and none of that will change, but also CBDC monetary policy, because with CBDC, you do get access to a second tool of monetary policy. Uh, a, brief, uh, uh, a few brief words about endogenous deposits and exogenous CBDC. Um, there, are, there was a big literature in monetary economics which dominated until around the turn of the century, uh, the last century, uh, where you would have models where households basically hold uh, money because of some demand for money because of a cash and advance constraint, transactions cost technology. But where, the way economists used to think about these models is that the money that you and I use in order to make purchases, the only money that ultimately matters in those models is the money issued by the central bank, i.e. reserves and cash. Now, you and I don't even have access to reserves, and cash is about 3% of the broad money supply in the UK, and the numbers are very similar across developed economies. So what we're doing in our work is basically saying this is not the right way to think about money um, because the money is, is really the other 97%. That's far more important. Uh, and so we have bank deposits as facilitating people's uh, technology, basically meaning making life easier for us. It's easier to buy stuff for us and also for companies to buy their inputs, etc. Okay? 
Uh, we omit government money entirely from our model because uh, the model is complicated enough and, and this is just not important enough. What we need for the government is the interest rate policy, which implicitly works, works for the market for reserves, but we don't have to talk about the market for reserves. Um, the, uh, and then uh, uh, we, we will then talk about bank deposits, but bank deposits are created through loans. Bank deposits are not something that the bank intermediates between you and I. And that's the next slide. I will talk about it. Uh, then CBDC puts exogenous government money back into the model, but CBDC is different from the other forms of money because first it is universally accessible. That's different from reserves, which, are only, which is only accessible to banks. It is interest-bearing. That's different from cash. And it competes with bank deposits. Um, so what we have here is a little representation of how the banking system works according to much of mainstream theory, which is the top, which is that a saver deposits something in the bank and the bank then intermediates what the saver has deposited. That is a completely wrong model of banking. No single bank ever, not in any single transaction, does a bank do that, okay? What the bank does is it creates a loan and creates a new deposit along with the loan for the same agent that comes along. If I'm, I was a banker myself for five years, when a customer came along, had some sort of, let's say, a track factory or something, I want to produce more tracks, I need to spend 10 million pounds, then I give a loan of 10 million pounds to this person, which is my right to receive money from him, and I give a deposit to this person, which is what I give to this person so that he can now build uh, buy stuff in order to build that factory. There is no intermediation. The, the, the money gets created by the bank and then once it has been created, this person who wants to build a factory can use it to exchange stuff against each other uh, with, 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 with other people. Um, but it's not like the bank is directly involved in the intermediation of goods. This is important to realize because once you build a model of CBDC, it is uh, this banking system that you are interacting with, and you need to first of all understand how that banking system actually works. Um, let me jump over this because I'm thinking I might otherwise run out of out of time. Um, banks uh, are modeled here uh, according. Uh, basically, there's a, a, a costly state verification. The banks don't quite know uh, ex ante how their loans are going to perform. Uh, and ex post, they need to spend money in order to verify how they have performed. This is based on the very famous paper by Bernanke, Gertler, and Gilchrist. So loans are risky, right? Banks, and, and in addition, uh, they are so risky that in our model, banks can actually make losses, uh, so they need to pay attention to having enough equity. And on the deposit side, we assume uh, a technology that is inherited from Schmidt, Groh, and Uribe, another very famous paper in this literature, where we have a transactions cost technology where people use money in order to do stuff with. But as I said at the beginning, typically what economists used to do is they put central bank money into this transactions cost technology, i.e. they put 3% of the money supply into the transactions cost technology. That's missing the boat. We're putting the other 97% in. And we're saying that this other 97% has been created in this way, at the bottom, not at the top. Right? Um, and then uh, the money is, is created uh, not, uh, and it, it's not just created by bank deposits then, but also by CBDC, right? It, with imperfect substitutability between the two. Uh, and then uh, what the banking system does is basically it, 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 it creates liquidity, and if there is not enough liquidity, that acts like a distortion, just like a tax distortion on the economic system. Meaning that if the banks suddenly cut back their lending a lot, you and I don't have enough cash to do business, even though physically and intellectually we're perfectly able to do this, but there's not enough cash to go around in order to do it with, we can't do the business. Uh, and, and that's what I call a liquidity tax. Um, whereas in the standard model of banking that you will find in literature these days, typically, it's literally a physical bottleneck that banks create because not enough goods migrate through the bank from one person to another. It's completely a different world from the one we live in. Okay. This is the liquidity generating function. Don't worry too much about the math. All, you, all I want you to see 
is that it's deposits and CBDC that enter it and jointly generate liquidity, jointly generate money, money that reduces our transaction cost. Fiscal policy. Here's a standard government budget constraint. And again, don't worry too much about the math, but B is government debt, uh, G is government spending, transfer, taxes on the right-hand side. This is just the standard. The government debt this period is the principal plus interest on the inherited government debt plus spending minus taxes, the usual thing, right? Where uh, central bank digital currencies enters here is in a very similar way to government debt with one important difference, which is that the interest rate on central bank digital currencies is much lower than the interest rate on government debt because this is money. This is used for transactions by you and I, and when it, uh, and, and in monetary theory, this is a very common thing. When something that is used for transactions doesn't, is not just valuable because, an in, because it pays an interest rate, but also because it carries a so-called convenience yield, which is the benefit I get from being able to buy and sell stuff and if I didn't, if I didn't have this, I, I just couldn't do business. And I'm willing to uh, accept a lower interest rate in order to get this convenience yield. And that is why central bank digital currencies have fiscal advantages, because they are cheaper to issue uh, than government debt. Then we have a fiscal policy rule. This is also important for the macroeconomic policymaker, because once you start talking about a digital currency um, on, a, on scale, you know, you're talking about, let's say, 10 or more percent of GDP, you're talking about very significant seniorage flows. Seniorage is the revenue from money creation, right? And therefore, you need to decide how you're going to deal with that revenue. And for example, the one thing that you really want to avoid is if suddenly there's a lot of additional demand for central bank digital currency and you satisfy it, you suddenly get a lot more seniorage revenue. What you don't want to do is to quickly spend it or to quickly use it to lower taxes. Because tomorrow the demand might change, and then you have to change taxes the other way. You generate a lot of volatility, and that's macroeconomically highly undesirable. So what you really want to do is you want to treat uh, these seniorage flows in such a way that they get smooth over time, and that means you basically want to target a ratio of uh, government debt plus CBDC over GDP, and we want to keep that stable over time. Uh, you want to, uh, or the change in that ratio, uh, which is basically the, 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 the deficit, the CBDC inclusive deficit to GDP ratio. And I, I show, we show in our paper that this really stabilizes and insulates the fiscal accounts from CBDC flows, which is a consideration that you cannot get away from once you talk about the system. Then we have the monetary policy rule. This is a standard Taylor rule, for, forward-looking Taylor rule. We don't need to look at all the, 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 the complicated-looking terms because it's really just a Taylor rule. So that would continue. And this is the interest rate on reserves. Okay? Reserves continue to exist. We are about to issue another uh, working paper at the Bank of England on this question, um, where some people are sometimes arguing, oh, central bank digital currency is just paying interest on reserves and making reserves accessible to everybody. We argue in that paper that that's a very, very bad idea and that reserves and central bank digital currencies need to be kept separate. And reserves are still used for clearing settlement balances among commercial banks, but central bank currency is a retail payments medium, perhaps also wholesale, uh, but it's a different type of money. And I talked to uh, 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 Schneider and Piazzesi about this the other day. They were saying, oh, what, yeah, you have to have red money and blue money, and that's true, okay? Uh, for CBDC, um, the question might arise, why would you, uh, what would you target? Would you target its quantity or its interest rate? And there are arguments against targeting monetary aggregates that date back to the debates in the 1980s around monetarism. Uh, and there were three arguments at that time. Let's see whether they apply to CBDC. Uh, first, you might have problems in defining the relevant aggregate because at that time, there people were talking about different private sector monetary aggregates. That's not true here. We're talking about CBDC and the central bank issues it directly, no problem. Number two, uh, you might have problems controlling the aggregate because the central bank in those days only controlled very narrow money and controlling all those other things is not just up to the central bank, it's up to the private banks. 
With CBDC, that's not a problem because you're controlling it directly. Number three, however, and this does apply, there might be lower benefits to controlling the aggregate than controlling an interest rate. This goes back to a very famous paper by Poole from 1970s, where he said that if money demand shocks are important and you're controlling the quantity of money, even though the demand for it goes up and down a lot, then you're going to create additional macroeconomic volatility that's macroeconomically undesirable. Uh, that also applies in our model, but quite weakly. And the reason is important to understand. Why is it weakly? Because in Poole's model, he was literally thinking about the central bank being able to control broad money directly, even though it only controls narrow money and the banks control broad money. But somehow the argument was, if we could control broad money, would that be desirable? We never were able to do that, I think. And... Uh, I, the argument here is in our model and in the real world, if you constructed this system, you would be able to control CBDC, um, but banks would remain the creators of the marginal unit of money. So even if you controlled the f uh, quantity of CBDC rigidly at the margin, the banks would satisfy the additional demand. Okay, so there's a weak pool argument here and that's the only argument against targeting quantities. Uh, but in order to study this question, we need to talk about what rules for uh, central bank digital currencies could you actually have. The quantity rule would go something like the formula there on the top. top. That is the ratio of central bank digital currencies to GDP is something that I target. I might just target it rigid, rigidly in our model, like 30% of GDP rigidly, and that's it. Or I might also have a feedback to inflation. Right? So this is basically saying we're fixing the quantity of CBDC. If the market wants more, the interest rate will adjust. How will it adjust? If the market wants more, the interest rate will go down. Because this is an interest rate on money, remember? And if the market wants more, that means it's convenient. the convenience yield of money is going up because so many people value money highly. They value money for what it can do and not just for its return. The central bank can pay less interest on it. Right? And the inflation feedback here with the negative sign, that means when there is a lot of inflation, the economy is overheating, I am withdrawing CBDC from circulation in a boom, right? Because that takes heat out of the economy. The price rule would say the, the interest rate on central bank digital currency is equal to I, which is the policy rate. And again, with the negative inflation feedback. So here I'm fixing the interest rate on CBDC and giving people as much as they want at that interest rate, but the only way they can get it is by handing in eligible assets. They cannot come to the central bank and say, take my bank deposits, I want CBDC. The central bank can say, no, we want eligible assets, that's government uh, uh, securities. So briefly, some policy experiments. The first is transition from a world without CBDC entirely to a world with CBDC, or 30% of GDP, engineered via an overnight purchase, to keep it simple, of 30% worth of GDP uh, of government debt. Right? And what we find is that this would lead to a roughly 3% GDP gain in the long run. Half of that almost immediately, the rest in the long run. And this is partly because of lower real interest rates. Why lower real interest rates? Well, basically because the government exchanges high interest, defaultable government debt for low interest, non-defaultable money. Because CBDC is not a defaultable uh, uh, liability of the government, because essentially you cannot ask for repayment of money in something other than money. So if I go to the central bank and say, hey, here's my CBDC, uh, give me some money, well, then the central bank is going to say, here you go, you have some more CBDC. Because that's the nature of money, right? You cannot ask for a payment of money in something other than money. So that's not defaultable, and it is lower interest. And that would, according to some empirical arguments that we make in the paper, uh, contribute to a lowering of the real interest rate. Uh, it would also generate seniorage revenue, money creation revenue, partly, mostly because of this lower interest rate, but also because you, every period, can issue a little bit more CBDC. Uh, and it would generate more liquidity at less cost, because the banks also create liquidity in this economy, but they do this subject to all sorts of costs and frictions um, that is costly for the economy, 
and uh, the economy can get closer to what in jargon is known as the Friedman rule, the optimum quantity of money, uh, by, by the central bank issuing some CBDC. It doesn't go all the way there, not even close, but it gets closer. Let me jump over this slide, which, which just shows, by way of impulse responses, uh, what I just said in words. So the 3%, of course, you can, if you want to, take with a grain of salt, because this is a highly calibration-dependent uh, uh, experiment, uh, and we can argue about the calibration. However, we spent a long time on this calibration uh, on US data, and if you want to challenge us, you need to do similar uh, homework uh, to what we have done. Now, uh, quantity rules versus price rules. So here we do an experiment, I hope you can all see this, um, where we're saying uh, there is a shock in the demand for, to total liquidity in the economy. The CBDC really is most important when you have financial sector shocks. So this is a shock to demand for total liquidity, where we're saying suddenly people want more money. They want more liquidity. You could in, in, interpret this as a flight to safety shock, where people want to sit on their money rather than spending it. They want more liquid, liquid balances. So that, uh, then when you have a quantity rule for CBDC, then you're saying, I'm holding the quantity fixed, and if people want more, then they have to get it from the banks. And the uh, fixed interest rate rule is say we, we, we are holding the interest rate fixed, and if people want it, they can come to us, but they have to give us eligible assets. Uh, you see that in the bottom row of, these, of this slide, the dotted line is a price rule. Um, when you pursue a price rule, i.e. an interest rate rule, keep the interest rate fixed, people want more money, central bank gives it to them, so the ratio of CBDC to GDP goes up by 4.5% there. Whereas in the other case, if you keep the interest rate fixed, then the spread between the policy rate and the CBDC rate uh, changes, namely the CBDC rate drops, as I explained earlier. That's the difference. Uh, but what you see in uh, the first column, middle row, that's what bank deposits do in response to this shock. And the numbers, uh, that's about a 12% increase in bank deposits in response to the shock. I made the shock large to make it easy to see. Uh, so there is an increase in demand for liquidity and the banks just satisfy it. And whether the central bank does or does not satisfy it on its end, is not as important in the overall scheme of things because when you see the, 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 the top left, uh, that is the evolution of GDP in response to this shock. It's, of course, contractionary because people are not spending, they're sitting on their money, right? So GDP goes down. But uh, the quantity rule, which is the blue solid line, and the price rule, which is the red dotted line, they do not differ by that much. The price rule is better, right? I am satisfying the additional demand for liquidity, and that helps. That's the pool effect, but it's very, very, very weak. One last addendum to this one. If the substitutability between bank deposits and CBDC was for some reason very, very low, then the pool effect would get stronger and stronger and the price rule bec would become more and more preferable. This, however, it's a very open research question that this theoretical research has thrown open, is what is that elasticity? How substitutable are bank deposits and CBDC going to be? And that's part of what we at the Bank of England put into the research plan for the empirical research agenda going forward. Two more things, then I conclude. I hope that's okay. Um, an argument that is uh, often made uh, with CBDC is, well, how about the banking system, stability of the banking system? Couldn't you have bank runs? Couldn't you have a run from bank deposits into CBDC? And a the run is much, much easier with CBDC because with cash, to run into cash is kind of cumbersome. You know, you have to get a stash of cash. You have to run to the bank first to get it. And that's why cash-based runs, we have seen them, but they're mostly a long time ago. Uh, with CBDC, you can do all this at a cl click of a button. Big mistake, okay? This is a big mistake. Not a complete mistake, but it's mostly a big mistake because what people are thinking about is what in, in economics we call partial equilibrium reasoning, right? Because I might decide that um, I want, for, uh, want to get more CBDC from you, Christoph, and I say, uh, here's my bank deposit. Can I have some CBDC from you? And if you don't see what I see and you have not paid attention, you might give me the CBDC and you end up with a bank deposit. If you look in the aggregate, so what? 
The same, bank de the same quantity of bank deposits still exists. The same quantity of CBDC still exists. It has just moved between me and Christoph. This does not matter to a first approximation. The only, thing, the only way in which the economy as a whole can run from bank deposits and CBDC into CBDC is that there needs to be a window open somewhere else, not between us. And that means the central bank has to basically say, would have to say, oh, if you want to get rid of your bank deposits, you can come to us and get CBDC from us. But that's what we ruled out. We said that this should not be a design feature, should never be a design feature of a central bank money that you can get it by, by handing in bank deposits. Um, you can only get it against eligible assets, i.e. against government debt. And so if there's a big run uh, into CBDC, it's going to be out of government debt, not out of bank deposits, because uh, it, it's very hard, it, it, it's almost impossible to do otherwise. That there are some limits, and in the new working paper that we're getting out in the next one or two months, we're going to talk about that there are some limits to that process, uh, but they really only arise under very extreme scenarios, okay? Um, Countercyclical rules, this is really cute, and I will conclude with that. This is a shock where we're saying for three years, uh, there is a boom in GDP because the banks are lending a lot. This is a famous paper by Cristiano Motto and Rostagno. Uh, they have this shock, it's a, it's a so-called risk shock. The banks think that the economy has become less risky. They create a lot of additional loans. GDP goes up, inflation goes up for about three years, and then suddenly, they, the banks decide, oops, uh, well, perhaps that wasn't right after all, and then they, they start to contract lending a lot uh, at the beginning of that, at the end of that third year. Now, uh, at the bottom, you have the policy rate. That's still the solid uh, line. The policy rate would basically fight inflation by rising, uh, and therefore, the real interest rate would rise. CBDC added to this system would be as follows. The, the dashed blue, uh, bl uh, black line down there would be to say, what if I had a CBDC rule that basically is keeping a fixed spread between the interest rate on government debt, or the interest rate on reserves, sorry, on reserves, uh, and the CBDC rate? Right? That's a fixed spread. What we're saying is that you can do better than that. You can take heat out of the economy when it's booming by withdrawing CBDC from circulation, and the way you're doing that is by making it less attractive to hold, i.e. by paying a low interest rate on CBDC, i.e. in order to fight a boom with CBDC interest rate, you need to lower the rate on CBDC, but not in absolute terms, relative to the policy rate. Okay? Because that takes heat out of the economy. It's still going up, but it's going up by much less than the policy rate. Then when you're crashing, uh, you are so then making it more attractive to hold the CBDC by not lowering the rate on CBDC as much as the policy rate. And you see in the bottom right in that chart, you see that during the boom phase at the beginning, the quantity of CBDC relative to GDP goes down, thereby taking heat out of the economy, and then it goes up. Uh, uh, in order to uh, buffer the crash. And this is the GDP response that corresponds to that, where the black line is when I have no response to inflation and I don't withdraw uh, CBDC in a, in a boom. And then the other two lines are as I successively become more aggressive at withdrawing CBDC during the boom and injecting it during the crash. And you can see this is only qualitative. This hasn't been calibrated and estimated yet. But qualitatively, you can see that potentially CBDC interest rates could make a nice contribution to further stabilizing the business cycle over and above what this, uh, the policy rate uh, uh, can do. So this is the conclusion. We find that in a theoretical model that's otherwise relatively standard um, and that central bankers know how to work with, CBDC has significant benefits, uh, increase in steady state GDP, 3% uh, for a 30% of GDP injection of CBDC, highly calibration dependent, but I challenge you, I think you'll have a hard time to have less than 1%, and in this business, steady state output gains, those are very big numbers. I, I, I talk from experience in looking at welfare gains and output gains, et cetera. These are very big numbers uh, compared to, to other policy experiments. Um, improved ability to stabilize inflation and the business cycle. Quantitatively, this is to be examined further, of course. Uh, 
should reduce some FS risk, financial stability risk, but may introduce others. But some of the others, like bank runs, while they may exist under extreme circumstances, the risks tend to be overblown because people tend to think of what they would be able to do individually, not what the economy as a whole would be able to do. Um, in our view, the critical issue is the, is the successful design of a transition. And of course, we see that that is the critical issue all around us because all the central banks are spending lots of resources and th in thinking about the nuts and bolts of this issue. About, about thinking hardware, software, protocols, uh, law, all these things is what central banks are thinking about. And, and in fact, at the time when we wrote this paper, and it's still more or less the case today, there was almost no uh, uh, economic research of this nature, especially with cutting edge models, to, to examine the question of CBDC. It's all the nuts and bolts, because if you don't get those right, you don't want to start this, because you, you start it and you say, oh, it all looks very good on paper, and the next evening you have egg on your face because you haven't done your homework. And that, uh, so, so that, that's still the phase we're in today, but if we get past that phase, and it is one way everybody has to move with great caution, but if we get past that phase, perhaps we can realize some of the benefits uh, that are outlined to you here. Thank you very much.